we'll assemble our, our panel. And uh, if you can think of some questions, we'll, uh, we'll either answer them or we won't, I guess, as the case may be. <coughs> Should we pick on people? No. You're not going to be the. What's that? Should we start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I guess this man had his hand up first. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah, so for, for, um, we're going to be repeating the questions to make sure the uh, re, uh, audio re catches this. The, so the question is, uh, I, I said in the talk, and other Austrians will say, oh, the Fed causes business cycles, but yet historically, I mean, the Fed was formed in 1913, and you clearly had financial panics, depressions with a small d before then, so what's the explanation? Uh, the, the quick answer, and I'm actually not an expert on those earlier you know, uh, 19th century p panic, so I can't delve into it too much, but the, the Austrian answer to that is that it was uh, government favors to the, to the banking sector. So, in other words, you, you, would, you would see periods, like a lot of times there'd be this boom and then crash during a wartime situation when the, when the, uh, the, the money supply did increase, money and credit supply did increase, and a lot of times the, the way that happened is because the government would give special exemptions allow the banks to suspend what they called specie payment, you know, redeeming uh, the green dollar bills for actual gold and silver. So th there, were, there were interventions in the financial sector giving banks these privileges to create money out of thin air, as it were, and that, that went hand in hand with the boom-bust cycle. But again, I can't give you specifics about each one. If uh, Tom Woods actually knows a lot more about that than I do. The, 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 because we, the Fed came into existence in 1913, but that doesn't mean we didn't have centralized banking. Uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, put in place the Bank of the United States in uh, 1781, which was a central bank. It was a precursor of the Fed, and uh, it had a 20-year charter, and Andrew Jackson vetoed the bill to recharter it in, uh, in you know, around 1830, around, around that time. Uh, and the, the, the Bank of the United States created 70% inflation in its first five years of existence. And then uh, we had a period from about 1840 to 1862 where we didn't have uh, centralized banking, but it was brought back into place by the National Currency Acts and the creation of the greenbacks by the Lincoln administration. And that was a, a, a much more centralized banking. It wasn't called the Federal Reserve, but it was a government-controlled centralized banking system. And, and it generally had m much of the same effect of creating boom and bust, bust cycles. I think uh, Jeff had his hand up. Yeah, uh, I had a question about uh, the Fed and the Bank of the United States. Uh, what is the The, the AARP membership, I think. Was, uh, the, well, the, the question was, uh, is there a natural political constituency for higher interest rates? Is there anybody who would be Okay, well, I think the, the political problem is a, is a public choice problem in that the, the lobbies for low interest rates in an in, uh, in inf inflationary monetary policy, like you said, the housing industry and, and all, of the, all the related industries. Uh, but the beneficiaries are, are very broad and unorganized retired people who would like to earn more than one half of 1% on their CDs, they're unorganized. They don't have a, a lobbying office in Washington, D.C. They're widely dispersed all over the country. And that's just, it's the same reason why a lot of government regulation 
benefits the regulated industries at the expense of the consumers because the industries lobby to make the regulations such that they benefit from it and the consumer gets screwed by it uh, because the consumers are not organized. There, there, are too, there are too many of them, too widely dispersed. I think it's the same explanation of uh, the savers. Even though uh, like the AARP does a lot to organize uh, retired people, mostly to get them to lobby for higher taxes and a bigger welfare state. Uh, but but this is another thing that so if they could get out of the clutches of the AARP, I would think it would be a natural uh, lobbying force if if a, a competing organization wanted to try to organize these people. I, I think just if I could follow up on that part of the problem, because you, you're right, and it doesn't make sense. You know, how come there aren't people? You know, there's winners and losers from everything. But I think part of it is just saving almost is a, is a bad word, especially during a downturn that people think that all oh, the the problem is saving. And so I think. It wouldn't be very, you know, because the lobbyists they they do stuff behind the scenes to to get what really benefits them, but then they also have to have PR firms and come up with catchy slogans. And I think it would be the the public is just so convinced that saving is awful, it would be hard to have you know a, a thirty second spot during the Super Bowl to you know say hey let's get people to save more, you know, and like to come up with a jingle for that. It really it, it would be hard for them to publicly, even though it's correct, you know. I mean, I guess they could could have. Us get up there, but we're you know we're not too too photogenic. So I mean it's um, or, or at least I, I don't speak for speak Doug for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, so I, I think that's that's part of it too. You know I mean by the same token, so you know how come there's not somebody you know lobbying to have you know uh, labor camps? You know that, they could make a lot of money building labor camps. And I think just and, and, and maybe they are actually, but um, but you, but you get my point that it's not merely you know someone getting money. It's also like they have to come up with some public spin. And ironically, it's very hard to justify savings right now, which is crazy, but I think true. Well, the economics profession has waged war on the idea of savings for uh, since the 1930s because of the, the Keynesian paradox of thrift. It said if you save more, you consume less. That reduces aggregate demand and causes a depression. Basically, so for God's sake, don't save. You're going to cause a depression, and uh, and that's sort of Greenspan's uh, take is sort of a, a variant of that, isn't it? It's those those damn Asians are saving too much. He said. He, I don't think he's called them the damn Asians, but I think that's basically what he said, though. I just wanted to add in that that um, we're all Keynesians now is roughly the mantra of the entire economics profession, except for the Austrians. Bob. Housing prices where they are, even without the credit, credit bubble, will, will they succeed? I don't want to hog the microphone. No, no, that sounds like a question for Bob. Um, okay, so the question was: the government wants to keep prices, housing prices, where they are, or or, or keep prop them up, and, and will they succeed? Um, I. It's hard because I think they have, I've seen some charts, and it's hard to know which metric to look at. But if you look at um, what is it, house prices to rent, and of course you're, you're aggregating to, to draw one line, like what's it mean to say, what's the house price in the U.S. right now? So, I mean, obviously these things are taken with a lot of so grains of salt. But that, that figure, that ratio that people look at, sort of like a P.E. ratio for the housing market, that was way up, you know, 2005 and started coming down. And actually now it's, it's it's not back to where it was in 97 let's say but it's actually dropped a lot and so people look at that but then on the other hand the problem with that is you know interest rates should really matter there and so you know in a in a pure you know present value accounting framework if interest rates are really low and you expect them to stay low for a while then you know you would think that the, the home price relative to the rental price should be higher so it's it's hard to know exactly what metric to use. So, I mean, I have seen mainstream economists thinking that, no, actually, it's, it's, it's a lot more in line with fundamentals now. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, it's just been so distorted that I, I don't... Like, if there weren't inflation coming, yeah, I would probably think real estate would be a bad investment. But then, on top of all that, I think there's going to be huge price inflation within the next few years. And so I do think they will succeed in propping up home prices because they're going to succeed in propping up a lot of stuff in terms of prices. Uh, and, and home prices historically have increased faster than most other things during periods of inflation because of the, you can't increase the total supply of housing very much even during a boom 
compared to the existing stock of housing, and so uh, prices are likely to go up. Well, they may, but I, I think in real terms, inflation adjustment adjusted, I don't think they'll go up all that much because there is so much debt um, that needs to be, you know, they, they say that all debts are repaid, uh, either by the borrower or the lender. And uh, right now we have the lender, we have the lenders paying off a lot of loans right now, and that's keeping the value of real estate. Uh, I think it'll keep a lid on it and con continue to force it down, and then the next shoe to drop will be commercial real estate in a big way. Uh, the way I see it, uh, the time preferences of the people is such that they're only willing to save for nine bricks, uh, building bricks for buildings. But due to the lower interest rates that are artificially created by the central bank or the Fed, uh, entrepreneurs are fooled into thinking they're really 10 bricks. So they start building bigger foundations than they otherwise would, uh, that they otherwise would have done had they realized there are only nine bricks forthcoming. So you get half-built places or you get, um, as Doug was saying, places where they uh, wreck their own houses or houses that are unsold. So th this, cre this creates um, uh, the big problem of overbuilding. And what we need to do, I think, as Bob said, is to get out of the housing, and, and we're not. I just wanted to say one more thing about Bob's uh, th uh, advice about um, getting low rental housing. My dissertation was on rent control. And my fear, and I'm, I'm sure Bob would agree that this is a danger, that if um, uh, people get into housing and, and uh, b the inflation comes and they want to raise the price of housing, rent control will be reimposed. Which gets back to the point I was making about prediction. Uh, Lester Thoreau was famous for predicting the rise of the Japanese economy right before the Japanese economy uh, tanked. Paul Samuelson used to have this thing in, in all of his um, uh, intro books where he, this would be the the U.S. economy sort of being flat, and this would be the Soviet economy coming up. Right before 1991, when it all went belly up, um, and yet, he, you know, so he was a bad predictor. Uh, oh, yeah, he, Tom uh, drew it. I don't know if you can... <laughs> uh, this is exactly what it happened. Every, if, if you look back in his uh, previous textbooks, every year the USSR was creeping up on, on the U.S., and... Uh, so he couldn't predict his way out of a paper bag, uh, nor could uh, Lester Thoreau. Uh, Irving Fisher predicted great things right before the Great Depression. On the other hand, John Maynard Keynes made a lot of money in the stock market. So the prediction is, uh, and on the third hand, Mises predicted the uh, Great Depression, and several Austrians, Erwin Schiff, um, uh, Frank Shostak, Mark Thornton, predicted the housing uh, uh, debacle. Uh, I, I reiterate the point I made before, that uh, there is such a thing as pure theory, and that Bob's advice is not as pure theory, but rather as thymology or as economic history, or he is speaking not as an Austrian economist when he gives that advice, but I, I do think that Austrian theory helps you see the world more clearly as it is, but it, it's certainly not a praxeological insight. I, I mean, I might, I might say, well, buy gold. Gold is going to rise in price, but the point is that FDR seized all the gold. And how are we going to know whether Obama is going to seize the gold if you go out and buy gold? It's not part of economic theory. Well, people will be trading more and more in barter, so be, try to become a middleman in the barter economy <laughs> would be my advice. Get somebody from the back of the room there. How about the lady here in the middle? Yeah. Um, you know, Renee needs to have knowledge. Alan Greenspan should have knowledge. He probably did not. So many of these people have access to the same information I don't think we should repeat that question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so the, the question was, you know, didn't these people know, you know, Greenspan, Bernanke, and these other wizards, they know? didn't they know this stuff? And so, you know, and, and yeah, I, I do think it, it's, how can I put it? The, the people in Washington, they're not stupid, right? I mean, they're evil, many of them, but they're not stupid. <laughs> And so it's, I mean, what, and I know that I'm not just speaking, you know, completely from the hip here that I, I work for a think tank that's based in D.C. And, you know, so I, I deal with, 
you know, I've actually you know met politicians and things and and so forth, and and I talk to their staffers and the way they think it's. It's not so much that they know the theory. It's not like they're experts in Hayekian business cycle theory and they choose not to believe it. It's more that, that that's irrelevant to them. You know, so like this, this stimulus package, people say, man, I can't believe Obama's so stupid. He thinks this is going to help. And if, if he really believed that, why isn't he spending the money earlier? And like Tom DiLorenzo was saying, it's because that's, that's not what's motivating him. He, you know, it's not so much that he cares in Keynesian economics or not. It's just, well, no, it, I believe in if I give this much money to this group, they're going to bring out the vote. When I'm coming up for re-election, and if I give this handout to this person, you see what I'm saying? And, and those are good theories. Those are very good theories, right? So they're good at getting re-elected. That's what their job is, and they're very good at it. And so it's, um, I think it's, it's wrong to, to even like argue with some of these people and just say, man, they're just not getting it. It's because it's, they're not trying to get it. They're, that's not what they're doing. Yeah, all, of, all of government is based on short-sightedness. Every congressman person runs for re-election every two years, six years for senator, four years for president, and they all know that the average voter forgets most of everything that they did except for what they did in the last three to six months, maybe. And so the incentive is always to spend now and tax later, and that's why everybody's uh, in favor of these gigantic deficits. And that's what really what drives Washington, in my view, the short-sightedness. And they also know that the government has such a gigantic propaganda, propaganda apparatus all the state universities in America are essentially the PR arm of the state, uh, that they can blame it all on capitalism and greed when, when, the, when the stuff hits the fan, which, which is what the way your husband would probably put it, I, I assume, uh, on there. And so, uh, so they're all arrogant and cocky about this, and, and all that matters is their own power and their own reelection, and that's what motivates them all. Greenspan, I'm sure, loved being called the maestro, and being interviewed by the Washington Post Style magazine and have his wife go on television and give us the image of him sitting in a bathtub reading uh, farm reports. I don't know if you ever saw that on 60 Minutes, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, good for you if you didn't. But, uh, <laughs> but, but they love that. But of course, ever since the Greenspan Depression, uh, Greenspan himself, sometimes I think he must be hiding in the same cave that bin Laden is hiding in. <laughs> Where's he been? You know, I haven't seen him. I, I wanted to disagree with Bob Murphy. He said that they were evil but not stupid. I think they're, <laughs> I, I think they're stupid also. <laughs> and, and, and my big uh, source on this is none other than Bob Murphy, who's done yeoman work in, in uh, fighting all of their stupidity and their misconstruals of Austrian business cycle theory. For example, that it's like a hangover theory. That was one of the things that uh, Bob uh, was uh, active in overcoming. Uh, I, I guess I would agree with they're more evil than stupid, but they're, they're stupid also. They don't, they refuse to read the stuff. Uh, the woman says uh, they just don't want to hear. They just don't want to hear. They'd rather call Austrianism uh, a religion or something. Um, I remember when I first started making speeches on rent control, and I was ready. I was ready to rumble. I had all the statistics, all the theory, and you know what the questions were from the journalists? Am I a landlord? <laughs> Do I know any landlords? Uh, have, uh, have I ever seen a landlord? I mean, you know, they weren't interested in the theory. They were interested in saying, aha, he's really uh, uh, not a theoretician or not an economist. He's just speaking uh, for money or something. Am I in the pay of landlords? Things like that. Um, how about the man here in the blue? Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, let's see if I can uh, paraphrase what he said. He, that uh, the, the problem is the people believe in big government, essentially, and, and it's it's overwhelmingly, and so. It, and they're anti-capitalist. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, there, there's a group in uh, Washington D.C. that actually did a uh, a study by they paid people to watch television shows for several months and write down you know anybody who's a criminal and it was 90 percent of all the murderers were businessmen in the in the, in the television. But I think oh, in response to your question of is it hopeless because the public has been thoroughly convinced that markets are evil and government is the answer? Uh, well, I think the problem is um, we're too used to looking at this whole thing horizontally, like we, we might have good guys over here who are the uh, limited government people and the bad guys over here are the statists. And if we can only get more of the good guys in, we'll, cha uh, we'll change things. Well, that hasn't really worked out too well for 200 and some years. But uh, there's another way of thinking about this is uh, devolving power away from Washington, D.C. Think of it vertically. And uh, you, you have this Tenth Amendment movement going on in the United States where something like 40 state legislatures have at least talked about it, issued resolutions saying we're not going to uh, enforce un what we think is unconstitutional laws. And then I think what's ultimately necessary is secession. I think uh, the United States would be broken up into 10 or 12 different republics. Thomas Jefferson thought in his time it should, it should happen. Uh, the, the founding fathers were terrified that the tiny little country they were they were uh, in charge of at the time would be unworkable un with uh, with democracy, even if it was limited by the Constitution. And uh, and so a country of 300 million, it's preposterous to think that it could be anything but a sort of a tyranny by majority rule. And so uh, the, the the only answer in my book is uh, is secession. I'd like to add to that. Um, I'm usually not into questions of the case for hopelessness. Is it hopeless or not? Because I will do the same thing whether it's hopeless or not. I'm having so much fun tweaking noses and telling the truth and writing and, you know, sh exposing the bad guys for the bad guys that they are. Uh, I think that there is a case for hopelessness. And that is, why is it that every freshman class I get, they're all a bunch of commies? I mean, <laughs> What's going on here? Is it biological? Well, I think there is a case for sociobiology, that we're hardwired to be socialists, and it's only through learning economics uh, that we uh, can transcend it. I started out as a socialist. I mean, I'm a, a Brooklyn Jew. That's redundancy for socialism. <laughs> uh, and the reason, the reason for that, the reason I think we're hardwired for it is... Uh, Sociobiology says that the reason we are the way we are now depended upon what it took f to survive a million years ago. And a million years ago, you had to do explicit cooperation. I help you this week when you're sick, you help me next week, and if we didn't do that, if we didn't have benevolence, we wouldn't have survived. But we, we had no markets then. So we weren't uh, uh, hardwired for markets. That's, I think, the reason that was like the rock of Sisyphus. On the other hand, the, the case for optimism is look at the USSR right before 1991 or look at Germany, East Germany, before 89, a week before the Berlin Wall fell. I'm sure if they were having conversations, they would say, oh, it's hopeless, it'll never happen, yak, yak, yak. And yet all of a sudden it happened. And two more cases for optimism, and one is uh, Ron Paul. Uh, Ron Paul is coming to... Um, speak at Loyola University this Wednesday, and the biggest problem we're having is finding a big room to, to get all the people in. I mean, he comes and he gets 15,000 people. It's just phenomenal. And the other case for optimism is the Mises Institute. Uh, it it uh, reverberates, it, it uh, blasts forth the Ron Paul message. So there is a case for optimism, there is a case for pessimism, but I think all the people in this room are gonna do the same thing we're gonna do anyway, namely try to promote liberty, so it really doesn't matter that much whether the case for optimism or pessimism is, is true, because we're going to do the same thing. I'll add a footnote to what Walter said, that Mises.org is the eighth most heavily trafficked economics website in the world. So it has a huge readership, much more than you realize. I guess I'm the hand picker. How about this side of the room? How about this man way in the back has had his hand up for about an hour? Do you guys want to do it? No, I don't want to dominate. Okay, so the question is Obama health care. Uh, I think it's going to be awful. Um, 
I'm uh, shocked. And, yeah, and again, with all this stuff, it's it's not merely, you know, the, in principle, it's bad. I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard, you know, it's like a death panels and all that stuff. But, I mean, it's, um, when you go, if you actually, you can download the thing. That's, that's one good thing, I guess, about our open society is all this horrible legislation is there for you to read. And, and, they, and they do disguise it, but like, it's very difficult. Like, they have, you know, various titles and it's, uh, you know, very lawyer, lawyer uh, legalese, but... You, you can go ahead and read and read this stuff and see for yourself. I mean, it's just setting up various. It, it's basically just again complete takeover, getting more power in the hands of the government. And again, I mean, it's just isn't it just ironic that every time you know the government wants to help us, it just so happens that the way it does it is by getting more money, more power, more decisions flowing through uh, Washington bureaucrats. So I mean, that's the healthcare legislation is like that. And I mean, the, I agree with this, you know the standard. Uh, talking points on this stuff that, yeah, it's going to re reduce uh, the availability of care. There's going to be research. There's going to be huge budget constraints down the road. And what are they going to do? They're going to have to cut spending, have to ration care. I mean, that's that's inevitable. I mean, this is Economics 101. That's what's going to happen. Uh, I think that this topic deserves a whole uh, panel or a whole discussion on its own, so I can only uh, talk for 30 seconds on it. But let me, let me just say that the whole problem started with guess which institution. You'll never guess in a million years. Yes, government. Uh, what happened was they, they had a maximum wage control, and uh, not minimum wage. Minimum wage is above. Uh, they, had, uh, they kept wages down, and when wages were down, on entrepreneurs had to compete for workers because there was a shortage of workers. And how did they compete for workers? Well, they offered them health care. I mean, why is, why is health care connected with wages? Why not car care or food care or, or anything else? I, they just picked... Uh, they just happen to pick health care. So that tie is, is a problem. The other problem is that, that medicine costs so bloody much. I mean, we don't have uh, uh, 43 million people not being uh, insured against not having bubble gum because bubble gum is cheap, so there's no problem. And, and there is no insurance anyway for it. The, and one of the reasons that health care is so expensive is because, blah, 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 is because of the AMA. The AMA precludes entry of doctors. Doctors' salaries are triple what they would be under a free enterprise system where you had uh, uh, not licensure but uh, certification. So I think uh, this whole problem is caused by government, and government is moving in the opposite direction. The correct direction to move is toward free enterprise, which is a shocking thing for me to say. I appreciate that. Yeah, government regulates and controls every aspect of health care in a thousand different ways, and including health insurance. In my state of Maryland, if you're going to if you're going to offer health insurance to your employees or sell health insurance, you're required by law to cover 31 different specialties, even massage therapy, because the massage therapists have a lobby, and the hair implants guys they have a lobby. So you have to cover hair implants, and of course, every one of these means you have to charge more as an insurance company because you're you're going to have more costs down the road by people who take massage therapy and hair implants and everything else. And it's, it's illegal in Maryland to sell a, a catastrophic insurance policy, just that. You can't sell it for a couple thousand bucks. Uh, you have to cover all 31 things, and every single state is like that. And so government has been doing this, and then it puts price controls uh, on Medicare and Medicare recipients that doesn't allow uh, hospitals to uh, recover the full cost of care, and as a result, they pass it on to the rest of us. Uh, in terms of health insurance premiums, ultimately. So government, as Walter said, is, is totally involved in regulating and controlling health care and has totally screwed it up. Ninety percent of the hospitals in the U.S. are government-run hospitals, and even the nonprofits are, are government-funded to some extent and therefore controlled and regulated. And so they've created the problem, and what government always does is in response to problems it creates, like the depression we're in right now, is to give itself even more power. And uh, anyone who thinks a government-run monopoly is a good idea uh, just has lost too many brain cells. Uh, and, and I mean, we, we even have these great examples. Uh, last week there was an article in the Vancouver Sun about what happens when you tell people health care has zero price, it's free, so-called, they're not really free, it's paid for taxes, you have an explosion of demand, and that drives up costs through the ceiling. And so governments, what do they do? They put price controls on to try to control the, the cost, and price controls cause shortages. So in Vancouver, they just announced that they're going to cancel 6,000 medically necessary surgeries, including neurosurgery and things like that. Not, not nose jobs and 
and boob jobs and stuff like that, but medically necessary life-saving surgery as a form of rationing. And uh, it was in Vancouver Sun. I blogged it on Lou Rockwell, but I don't think anybody else has picked it up But that's uh, that I know of. But that's the sort of thing that will happen. It's inevitable. You have massive shortages. In England, uh, they, have, they have shortages that cause such things as if you uh, – PBS had a show on a few years ago of a man with a hernia, and he looked like a pregnant woman. The hernia was so bad. And he was standing. He was saying, if I lived in that neighborhood over there, and he pointed across town, I could have my operation tomorrow because there's a short line over there. But I'm assigned by the government to this hospital here, and there's a three-year waiting list. So I have to wait three more years with this big belly and, and this uh, horrible hernia. And that, that's, that's what Americans have uh, to look forward to if we have uh, nationalized health care. And uh, our friend Yuri Maltzeff wrote an interesting article on Mises.org on how it was in the USSR with single-payer health care. Uh, you know, he grew up in the USSR. We have time for only one more question. I'm the picker, okay. Uh, you're the, no, you're the decider. The, I'm the decider in chief. <laughs> Where are all the women with their hands up? We've got all these, all these guys. You have, okay, you, the lady up here. I would like to uh, know if you were mentioning those shows yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, uh, the, Thank you, Walter, <laughs> the Jewish mother of the Austrian <laughs> economics <laughs> movement. The question was whether I, th <laughs> whether I thought the uh, commercial real estate uh, problem, uh, coming problem, as I put it, uh, would be handled the way the, uh, the residential is. Uh, there are attempts to get public money into uh, to prop up those mortgages, to provide additional financing. I think there's true $2 trillion worth of commercial uh, real estate paper coming due in the next uh, three to four years. And uh, at this point, most of those properties are underwater in terms of loan to value. And so it would be highly difficult for them to get financing. I don't think the outcry um, uh, from the public will be quite... Um, as strenuous as it would be for housing to help people in housing, helping your average real estate developer uh, satisfy his <laughs> problems is probably not going to have as much political traction. So I think you'll have um, I think you'll have a lot of commercial real estate um, go bust, and uh, we'll prolong uh, what we've been talking about today for a long, long time. <clears throat> but money talks, and the commercial developers have a lot of money. So votes are one thing in politics, but money also counts. So I'm not, I'm not so sure we won't see a bailout, uh, maybe maybe disguised in the, lex, in the next surface mining bill or something like that. <laughs> but because uh, they, they aren't going to say we're going to – although they did say we're going we're gonna to bail out our rich friends at Goldman Sachs. So why wouldn't they say we're going to bail out our rich friends at the commercial de uh, real estate development company? Yeah. Have anything more, Walter? <laughs> Robert? <laughs> All right. Well, that's the uh, that's the conclusion of uh, of uh, our Mesa Circle here in San Francisco. I want to thank all of you for for attending. Uh, I want to mention Mark Hart the Third again, who was our uh, sponsor. Yeah. Mark is uh, a businessman in Fort Worth, Texas. He came to our Mesa Circle in January in Houston, was terribly energized, and uh, sponsored an event like this in Fort Worth. Uh, earlier this year, he sponsored this one today, so we owe him a great uh, debt of gratitude. I want to mention our uh, cards again. If you want to join uh, the army, the growing army of uh, Mesa supporters, and uh, get a free copy of, uh, what's the name of the book? <laughs> Reassessing the Presidency. That'd be a wonderful thing. I want, to, uh, I want to mention the staff, because these things don't come together all by themselves. Uh, Christy, who you met when you checked in. Will, Chad, James. They all do a wonderful job of, uh, of putting these things together. I want to thank our speakers. Uh, for uh, a fine day of talks. And uh, 
I want to leave you with something from uh, Ludwig von Mises. He said, Every, everyone carries a part of society on his shoulders. No one is relieved of his share of the responsibility by others, and no one can find a safe way for himself if society is sweeping towards destruction. Therefore, everyone in his own interest must thrust himself vigorously into the intellectual battle. I want to thank you for thrusting yourself into that intellectual battle today. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs>